The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The tax collectors and the sinners were all seeking the company of Jesus to hear what he had to say, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained. This man, they said, welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. A man had two sons. The youngest said to his father, Father, Let me have the share of the estate that would come to me. So the father divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son got together everything he had and left for a distant country where he squandered his money on a life of debauchery. When he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine and now he began to feel the pinch. So he hired himself out to one of the local inhabitants who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. And he would willingly have filled his belly with the husks the pigs were eating, but no one offered him anything. Then he came to his senses and said, How many of my father's paid servants have more food than they want? And here am I, dying of hunger. I will leave this place and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your paid servants. So he left the place and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity. He ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms and kissed him tenderly. Then his son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the calf we have been fattening and kill it. We are going to have a feast, a celebration, because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was out in the fields and on his way back. As he drew near the house, he could hear music and dancing. Calling one of the servants, he asked what it was all about. Your brother has come, replied the servant, and your father has killed the calf we have fattened because he has got him back safe and sound. He was angry then and refused to go in, and his father came out to plead with him. But he answered his father, Look, all of these years I have slaved for you and never once disobeyed your orders. Yet you never offered me so much as a kid for me to celebrate with my friends. But for this son of yours, when he comes back after swallowing up your property and his women, you kill the calf we have been fattening. The father said, My son, you are with me always, and all I have is yours. But it is only right we should celebrate and rejoice, because your brother here was dead and has come to life. He was lost and is found. The Gospel of the Lord. When God gives, he gives superabundantly. The manna God gave to the Israelites in the desert in our book of Joshua this morning was to stop their whinging. Because they looked to other things, other created things, to satisfy their needs. The manna, the manna, the bread from heaven, stopped them selfishly complaining and turning in on themselves so that they would look to God to supply in the hardship. The the golden calf was meant to be something tangible when God himself, when God revealed himself in a mystery, and so the Ten Commandments were instituted. So all these things in the desert were meant to help their faith and call them closer to him, trusting in him in the hard times. So in both cases, God supplied He supplied abundantly. He gave them food when they needed it. He gave them an ethical way of living. And most importantly, a way in which to worship him properly. By the end of their time of purification in the desert, the promised land that God had given them would at least look after their physical needs. 
But their spiritual needs, however, would soon drive them to crave the coming of the Messiah. Forward to the Incarnation, they would discover that the law of love is far more freeing than the old law of obligation. They would discover that the bread of life himself would satisfy all their needs. They would discover that their basic desires for love, for mercy and forgiveness would be found in Jesus. They would again discover that God gives to his children super abundantly, but in ways that, of course, they did not expect. So the parable of the prodigal son is important to us because it tells us what God is like and what he does. It tells us about ourselves in our own waywardness and gives us the model for forgiveness when it is best for us. So while the parable is primarily about God, there is something of the characters in each of us. The God the Father's abundant mercy and forgiveness to the penitent sinner shows us what it is to forgive. So we can see ourselves in the role of the parent who sees the return of a wayward child. The father too is a different kind of prodigal. He keeps on giving and trusts that his wayward son comes back. His hope is something only God can grant. We can easily write off someone because we think they're lost or they're not worth it. And yet, again, God's superabundant mercy and love brings about this great act of metanoia, what the Greeks called metanoia, or a change of heart, and a deep desire to amend. Some of us could certainly identify with the brother who scoffs at the frivolity of the returned and contrite son, even when we've also been at the coalface for so many years and sometimes it can seem like we're left behind or forgotten. No, we haven't been forgotten. God does not forget his children. But we also don't let the devil whisper into our ears that God has abandoned us. But of course we keep at it if we find ourselves tired from the journey. But I would say most of us, if not all, can identify with the prodigal son. The French theologian Henri Nouwen once wrote that we become the prodigal son every time we search for unconditional love where it cannot be found. It's profound. We become the prodigal son every time we search for unconditional love where it cannot be found. We look for things that cannot satisfy which God alone satisfies. So how tragic it is that we go searching in those empty voids only to make ourselves emptier. It's like the stranded sailor who drinks salty water to satisfy his thirst. In the end, it only makes him worse, or perhaps kills him. And so the great prodigality of the father gives back to the contrite son or daughter everything that is theirs. So the ring is a symbol of authority, the robe, one of power. So he gives his love for his son by restoring all that he has left behind. And more, more on top of that. And this is the great benefit of confession. We are again restored to a right relationship with God the Father. Because it is in confession that we become like that prodigal son, experiencing the great prodigality of the Father. The call to conversion goes out to each of us, no matter what stage of the spiritual life we might find ourselves. Every one of us needs a God-given grace to return and keep on returning to, to God. We are offered so much by the gifts of, that God gives us. Each grace of each day is such a blessing. The peace that we live in, for example, is one of those blessings. Not everyone, of course, in the world shares this. And these things build up our gratitude. Gratitude inspires a spirit of thanksgiving in each of us that we attribute every blessing to God. And we look to him in the hard times, of course. We have to keep in mind that God the Father continues to give and give and give and keep on giving. And that, that is prodigality. 
So with his help, we are moved to contrition and metanoia, a change of heart. The prodigal son tells us about God the Father and the daily need for us to return to him. It tells us about ourselves. In either son, we have squandered or rejected those who return. So the question that this gospel passage leaves us with is this. God is offering us superabundant gifts of grace and of his son Jesus. Are we open enough to God's grace to accept such gifts?